Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Caitlin Elizabeth, and I would really love if you would hit that like and subscribe button. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you guys are all having a great Thanksgiving and eating great food. Today's case is actually about Thanksgiving. It's a case about the Thanksgiving Day killer. Paul Michael Merhige was born September 10th, 1974. There isn't too much information about his upbringing, but it seems he came from a pretty loving middle-class family in the Miami suburb. His parents were named Michael and Carol, and two years after Paul was born, his twin sisters Lisa and Carla were born. Throughout the years, it did seem though that Paul and his sisters had somewhat of a troubled relationship. Um, when Paul was just a teenager, an argument actually broke out between him and his family in his home, and it was just a minor argument, nothing really too drastic, and his parents even did say he was really overreacting to whatever the argument was about. There's not much information on what it was about, but it is said that it was just a minor argument. But then Paul, he actually pulled out a loaded gun on his family and threatened to shoot them. A friend of the family said that he was only 13 years old at this time. Besides this incident, it did seem though that he loved his family. Into his high school years, Paul was an honor student. He was a varsity athlete. He played football, baseball, and soccer. He led the French Honor Society and even graduated third in his class at Gulliver Prep, which was a pretty pricey school in Miami. All of his classmates really only had pretty good things to say about him. Um, he was given the reputation of being driven and mature, handsome and fit, personable but quiet, well-liked, and it seemed that he was pretty popular. One of his previous high school friends said that he thought Paul was going to be running a business or some sort of corporation and that he always seemed to have everything together and going for him while other students and friends at the time seemed to just be fumbling around. Paul even dedicated his senior page in his high school yearbook to his family. On this page, he thanked his family for all they've done for him and even said how much he loved his family and especially his twin sisters. He said that he was lucky and blessed to have twin sisters and to be their protective older brother, and even went as far to thank all 32 members of his family and said, quote, I love you now and will forever. He would later go on to study at the University of Miami to become a doctor. Now, he did graduate, but it is unclear on what he actually got a degree in. When Paul was around the age of 19, things did take a turn, though. His mom said that when he was 19 and attending college, he had a nervous breakdown and was never the same since. There were reports that at some point during this time, Paul had shot himself due to to depression. There wasn't much said on what happened after this or if he ever received any help for his depression, but after graduating, he never held a job and was supported by his parents. The next that we actually hear or know anything is around 1998 and 1999 when Paul filed for a restraining order against his sister Carla. Now, Paul and his sister's relationship always seemed somewhat rocky and he even went as far as to try and get protection from the police against his sister Carla because he stated that she had threatened him and also that his family didn't understand or support him with his issues and that he was being tested for obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD at the time. But a few weeks later, he did drop the request. There is really no other documentation or anything else really discussed until 2006 when this time Carla actually filed for a restraining order against Paul. She stated that he was refusing to take his medication for his mental illness and claimed he threatened to kill her on a regular basis. Just as he had done several years before, Carla dropped the request a few weeks later. In 2009, Paul was 35, and at this point in his life, he seemed to be becoming pretty unstable mentally. So we know he suffered from OCD and depression, and it has been reported that his OCD was actually pretty bad, and it was so bad that to the point where he would repeatedly take showers and shave, and there weren't just short showers, but really long showers. He was also really fixated on his receding hairline. It started when he was around seven and it really bothered him to the point he was taking Rogaine for it in high school. I guess he had been fixating on this for a really long time. It comes up a lot in the research I did and they just talk about how he was really fixated on his receding hairline and it really bothered him. Now with him being OCD, he was also a germaphobe. He wouldn't ever wear shorts because he didn't like the idea of his legs getting dirty and he would always wear two sets of underwear at all times. He struggled to make decisions and 
and was unable to hold a job, which is why his parents did support him financially. And it was also reported that he suffered from insomnia. Now, one of the symptoms of OCD is revisiting situations in your mind, whether it was a couple days ago or years ago, and it's believed Paul did this a lot. It could have been a simple insult or comment from his family or anyone really, but Paul would fixate on it and go over it again and again in his mind. He also didn't keep up on his medication. He would skip it a lot or just not even take it at all. And it's not reported on how many times he attempted suicide, but it's hinted that it was more than once. And it's also known for sure that he threatened it a lot. Also, he threatened to kill Carla on what seems more than one occasion. So on Thanksgiving Day 2009, the Merhige family was invited to have dinner at Paul's cousin's home. And his home was in a gated upscale community in Jupiter, Florida. His cousin Muriel and her husband Jim owned the home and they had a six-year-old daughter named Michaela. There were 16 people there that day enjoying Thanksgiving dinner. It seems though that Paul wasn't even really invited to this event, just his other family members. And it's actually Paul's parents that wanted him to come and they seemed to be the ones who invited him. Paul actually was late to this dinner and no one really knew he was even going to come or expected him, but he called his dad, Michael, to ask for directions to his cousin's home. Paul had expressed beforehand to his parents that he was anxious about the dinner and never actually really committed to coming to dinner until that actual phone call where he was asking his dad for directions. His dad then announced to the family that Paul was on his way. Paul's cousin-in-law, Jim, whose house they were actually having the dinner at, said that he never heard anything bad about Paul and he was family and was welcome to his home, even though he was showing up last minute and unexpectedly. He did know that Paul rarely ever attended family events and he had only previously met Paul twice and hadn't seen him in over a decade. So Paul was obviously a little bit odd or thought to be a little bit odd by this point in his life. Um, some of his family thought that he suffered from mental illness and some also claimed that that was just an excuse to justify his actions and that he was nothing more than a lazy 35 year old man who was still being supported financially by his parents because he wouldn't hold down a job. Now after his dad announced him coming, Paul's mom said that she told Paul's sister, Lisa, I hope he doesn't come and kill us all tonight. Lisa said that it came to her mind also, but don't tell dad because he would be upset. So during the Thanksgiving meal, Paul actually just sat very quietly and ate nothing, but his behavior wasn't really unusual for him. And his relatives said that Paul didn't really show any red flags for what he was planning to do later that evening. After dinner, the family gathered around the piano together, led by Michaela, the only child in attendance. She then went on to recite Psalm 100 and actually was giving them a preview of her performance for the Nutcracker, which was to be the next day. Michaela was joined by Paul's sister, Lisa, who was actually pregnant at the time, and her twin sister, Carla. Patrick, who was Lisa's husband, recalls sitting next to Paul at the time and saying to him, isn't she so cute, referring to Michaela. And Paul replied, yeah, yeah, it's cute. Again, Paul wasn't really showing any red flags to anyone because he was always a little bit awkward and not really present in the family event. So after this, Michaela was put to bed and it was around 9.30 p.m. Things started to shift though as the goodbyes started. Patrick recalls being outside with the younger adults while the older ones were inside. He remembers being outside with Paul and Carla and he told them him and Lisa were about to leave. Paul then told him that they should stick around a bit longer. Patrick said no, they were tired and he was just waiting on his pregnant wife to get done saying her goodbyes to everyone. This is when Paul drew out a gun and shot both Carla and Patrick and then made his way inside the house. Patrick was able to get Carla into the living room and this is where he witnessed a horrific scene. Paul shot his pregnant sister, Lisa, and then his aunt was shot in the shoulder and fell to the floor. Her husband, Antoine, was on top of her and trying to stop the bleeding. Paul then shot her in the chest, blowing a hole in her sternum. Shortly after this, Patrick remembers that he heard Paul say to his dad, I've been waiting 20 years to do this. Paul then went to the room where Michaela was sleeping in. He shot her once while she was asleep, took a step out of the room, but instantly went back in and shot her two more times. This was all while Michaela Kayla's parents were outside and her dad, Jim, was trying to break himself into her room to get her out of the house. Jim actually originally went to the neighbor's house asking them for a gun and told them there was a shooter in the house, but the neighbor didn't have a gun. And this is when he went to try and break her out of her room. 
room. Jim later gave a statement saying that he doesn't think Paul planned to kill Michaela originally, but he thinks he became jealous when he saw how delighted the family was in her singing. He said, quote, he tried to snuff out the light. He came into a baby's room. He saw her innocence and he walked in and purposely killed her. Before Paul left the house, he tried to shoot his uncle twice, but the gun jammed. Paul had only been at the house for about three hours prior to committing this massacre. Once the paramedics arrived, Patrick says that he remembers them going straight to Michaela first. Then they shouted fatal and then they went to Carla and shouted fatal. He then remembers them coming to him and saying we got one as he lay there on the floor half conscious. Patrick was in the hospital for three months after this. His wife Lisa and their unborn child didn't make it. Patrick was the only one who was shot that made it out alive. The hunt was on for Paul as soon as he left the crime scene. He left in a blue 2007 Toyota Camry. He also shaved his head and was going by the name John Baca. Prosecutors issued an arrest warrant for four counts of first-degree murder and two counts of attempted first-degree murder. A $10,000 reward was offered for information leading to his arrest. Six days later, there are records of him checking into the Edgewater Resort Motel in South Florida, and investigators did say that he wouldn't travel far based on his behavior, and they were actually right. It is rumored that in the motel room, he may have tried to commit suicide or at least thought about it, and 38 days into hiding, on January 2nd, 2010, he was found in his room by police. It was actually the owners of the motel that reported him to the police after seeing him on a TV episode of America's Most Wanted. The owners told the police that Paul was very private, he wouldn't let housekeeping in his room, and he only left his room to do laundry. So after being taken into custody, his lawyers were trying to get the insanity plea for him, but the family didn't want this and argued that it was premeditated murder. It was found out that Paul had actually spent $2,000 on four guns and ammo at two different gun shops only weeks before for that Thanksgiving dinner. He also withdrew $12,000 in cash from the bank. He stashed it in his car and packed his clothes up as well before this dinner. All this was evidence pointing to him planning to run away and hide out and showing that this was premeditated. Plus what he said during the murders about how he's waited 20 years to do this proves that he has been planning or at least thinking about this for a while. So there are court documents that describe Paul as mentally ill with the history of suicide attempts and threats to the family. Now experts Experts do say that he's not insane, but his behavior resembles more of a sociopath. He knew killing was bad, but he just didn't care. The only mental illness that were documented that he did have was OCD and depression. It was also known that Paul didn't have the best relationship with his family, and after the shooting, Paul's dad was interviewed by the police and admitted that Paul had held a grudge at least against his parents because he thought that they didn't do enough to take care of him. So prior to when he was caught by the police, there were calls from Jim and and the America's Most Wanted host, John Walsh, that were pleading for the prosecutor to seek the death penalty in this case. A few weeks after he was caught, the district's attorney's office announced they were going to seek the death penalty. However, in October of 2011, just a few months before the upcoming trial, it was announced that the prosecutors and defense attorneys had actually made a deal with Paul. Jim states that at the hearing, the deal had been made hastily and that his family had only learned about the deal two days prior to it being announced. He continued to beg the judge not to accept the plea bargain and was feeling that the death penalty should have been sought after. The judge did listen to Jim and was sympathetic to him, but explained that there was little that could be done and that he was going to give the maximum sentence allowed by the law, which was seven consecutive life sentences. Patrick Lisa's husband testified at the sentencing that he saw Paul as nothing more than a, quote, fat loser who was jealous and angry at his sisters and did nothing but stayed on the computer all day. Paul's parents also spoke in court and they did agree with the plea deal that he was being given. But one thing to note is that as much as his parents did support him financially, they did not pay for him to get a defense attorney, so he was represented by a public defender. Just before the conclusion of the case, a new twist did emerge. Antoine, Muriel, and Jim filed a civil case against Michael and Carol, who were Paul's parents. Patrick also filed one against them, and eventually the cases were combined together into one. They said that Michael and Carol not only took it upon themselves to invite Paul to the Thanksgiving dinner, but they knew that he was not taking his medication. The suit claimed that by these actions, Michael and Carol had created a foreseeable zone of risk. The suit went on to claim that Michael and Carol knew that Paul held hostility towards certain family members, especially his sisters, 
and that he expressed anger many times toward them in the past. The appeals court did rule that the circuit court was correct in dismissing the case, and they stated that the parents couldn't be found negligent in their son's actions. The court stated that if they were to rule against Paul's parents, that other family members in general would live in fear of being sued if they were to take mentally ill family members or relatives places. It went on to say families should be encouraged to include a troubled family member in the family circle. The final outcome of the case was that Paul pled guilty in exchange to not being given the death penalty and he waived his rights to appeal. He wasn't able to plead the insanity defense and be sent to a mental hospital so he just took the deal. He was given seven life sentences. We don't know why Paul did what he did on that fatal Thanksgiving day. He hasn't even said why he did it but many people think that after his break down, he was jealous of his sisters and their success and thought of himself as a failure and just needed someone to blame. And this resentment towards his family turned into rage. On top of the rage, his OCD and his constant fixations on issues he had with his family may have pushed him over the edge. Or on the other hand, some believe that he was a sociopath who did have OCD and depression, but the rage and jealousy was his motive to kill and he just didn't care. Either way, it doesn't really matter what the reasoning was. He did it out of selfish intent and took and ruined many lives that day. There is one positive thing though that did happen. It was announced two years after that Thanksgiving night that Jim and his wife Merle were pregnant with their second daughter. Then in 2012, they had their third daughter. They still live in the home where the murders took place and Jim said that one awful night doesn't erase the years of happiness that they spent with Michaela in the house and if they were to leave the house, they would be leaving all those memories behind. They decided to actually leave her room and keep it how it was and Jim said that it was him and his wife's faith in God that got them through the loss of Michaela. They have actually moved forward from this and say that they have found forgiveness towards Paul. Jim says that he still deals with rage and all the emotions you can probably imagine he would have after this terrible loss, but his faith in God helps him be able to forgive and move forward. Patrick has also been working to move forward as well. When he was shot, he was shot in the stomach and actually went into a three-month coma and after waking up in the hospital, his mother muscles had atrophied. He could barely even move. He couldn't even lift up his head. He said that during this time he cried a lot and was filled with sorrow and it was weeks before he could even touch his face and he had to relearn how to do basically everything. During his recovery, he learned that self-pity wasn't the way of real healing and he said, quote, you get to decide how you want to carry it for the rest of your life because you can't get rid of it. You can't make it go away, but you can decide how to carry it. I think the way both of these victims handled moving forward in their life is very inspirational and a lot can be said about these individuals just based on this. It's unimaginable the pain they have felt because of one selfish person who decided to ruin their lives on a day that is supposed to be about families and giving thanks. Well, that's all I have today, guys. I'm sorry if I put a damper on your Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really helps. And please stay safe out there and always be aware of your surroundings. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.